Okay. Well, thank you. So I, I want to discuss the idea uh, or a conception of moral reasoning and the uh, the moral the moral point of view as a framework for deliberating about peace and justice as well as including uh, environmental ethics more more specifically. Um, to begin, ethics and morality concern the basic question of what should we do. Uh, they concern what is uh, two fundamental questions of 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 uh, what we should do, what is good, and uh, what is right, as uh, fundamental questions of the human experience. And this also, this question relates to. Uh, the existence and validity of social norms as well. Um, social norms uh, define the terms of social cooperation that are uh, foundational to basic institutions of society. Uh, and so we, ha we, we can ask, there are, of course, social norms evolve uh, out of history and out of custom and cult cultural custom. Uh, but we can, uh, we can ask of any social norm and any institution, whether it is right or wrong, whether, whether it is just or unjust, uh, whether it is good or bad. Um, so we can, uh, we can evaluate our social, existing social norms and existing social institutions for their rightness or wrongness, their uh, their goodness or their whether they are just or not, we don't have to blindly accept, and we shouldn't blindly accept our our cultural norms and in institutions, because they can be unjustifiable, and we could give many examples of unjustifiable social norms that were. Uh, widely accepted, but turn out upon further scrutiny to be unjustifiable. So to say something is right or wrong, an action, a practice, um, a state of affairs as good or not good, uh, to, make such uh, to make such statements is to make claims, uh, normative claims. And like any, like an empirical claim, normative claims also need to be backed, backed up by valid reasons and not merely personal preferences. Uh, and this is, an, this is a claim of, that there should be a rational basis, a rational basis for uh, uh, claim ethical and uh, moral claims that we should be able to provide reasons for their justifiability. So the, from this perspective, the process of moral reasoning and judgment is one of deliberation, and that includes offering reasons uh, for the justification of our claims. What I'm uh, offering here is a, is it, is a, what is referred to as a post-metaphysical conception of moral reasoning. And that's, that's a conception that's free from metaphysical foundations or assumptions uh, that offers a freestanding independent conception of moral reasoning, not grounded in particular metaphysical assumptions. Uh, and it's a, um, it's a point of view that um, rejects the, or not rejects, but uh, offers a different perspective to, to a, a very uh, longstanding historical uh, point of view of morality that uh, there exists a independent moral order to the universe and that human beings are capable of comprehending that moral order and being um, and living their lives in accordance with that moral order. Um, and often historically, uh, that, that independent moral order uh, was thought, believed to be a creation of, of some divine power, uh, God or gods or 
uh, some higher power that uh, inhered reality with uh, moral principle and, and ethical value. The conception here is, is not assuming uh, such an independent moral order, uh, but that uh, moral reasoning is grounded only in the presuppositions uh, that define fairness and justifiability. So uh, kind of a footnote on the foundation of this moral approach, of mo uh, this approach to moral, moral reasoning, that it's post-metaphysical. Uh, of course, one can, one, one can and often does have their own, one's own personal metaphysical beliefs that inform uh, one's moral thought, one's moral reasoning. But often those uh, personal religious or metaphysical points of view are not shared by, by everyone in, uh, in one society. So in, to, in order to deal with social pluralism, uh, we appeal to a post-metaphysical conception of moral reasoning. Um, the nature of, of normative justification or ethical and moral justification is based in reason and uh, that justification is inherent in reason in the sense that reason uh, is, a justification is about offering reasons in support of one's claims. So justification is the offering of reasons uh, broadly defined. However, moral reasoning is not solely subjective. We're not, we're not um, deliberating with ourselves as such, but uh, moral reasoning is uh, addressed towards others. It's social in its, uh, it's, in its intent. Uh, reasoning, uh, logical reasoning could just be purely subjective. We reason out our own points of view, but normative justification and moral reasoning is always addressed to others and therefore is dialogical and, and social. Um, and often it concerns, mainly it concerns the terms of social cooperation and organization. And our reasoning is public in the sense that it is uh, addressed to others. It is public reasoning is the idea. Now our claims, our judgments of good and right uh, following Kurt Bayer, um, among others, uh, are uh, contingent upon further justification. So our judgments must should be uh, based upon criteria uh, that speak to their moral legitimacy and their moral justifiability. And well, we'll I'll, I'll explain that further in a, in a minute or two. Um, so we need not only consider the terms of social cooperation, that is principles of justice and ethical goods and moral norms uh, themselves, but we also need to cri uh, consider the criteria or the standards of validity upon which we can assess their justifiability. So it's ki that's kind of a meta, a meta level of moral reasoning. So normally we, we reason in terms of our ethical values and our principles. Uh, this perspective is that we also have to think about and uh, scrutinize the, um, the assumptions, the presuppositions of, of those principles and those ethical values and, and uh, also test them in the light of particular criteria of validity. So that gives rise to the question then of how, how can we determine whether our values and principles are in, in accordance with the best reasons? Uh, how, do, how do we go about that? 
and uh, that is what what defines our the de moral deliberation. And there are our, at least four levels to to this deliberation. One is to identify our considered convictions, our our moral convictions that are commonly accepted, perhaps and affirmed as part of the background culture of one society, however we define that culture. Or, or uh, and it, it might, uh, might be a, um, it, it might be a subset of the, of the larger culture as well. So in the, in the first step, we, we need to identify our convictions. An example of a conviction is, uh, well, I'll, I'll, I'll give you examples later in a, few, in a minute or two about convictions. So one is, uh, one is our, our conviction. Um, and then uh, the second step is to reflect on the justifiability of those convictions uh, from the moral point of view, which I'll explain below. That is, uh, we should reflect on the justifiability of our, our, of our basic moral convictions uh, using primary criteria of moral validity. And once we have uh, scrutinized and justified our convictions, then we can turn to our, our principles. We can consider our, uh, our principles of justice and our general principles and uh, norms uh, and ethical values uh, and, and ask whether they are consistent with our convictions. And then we can apply once, once our principles of justice are, and our principles of moral, moral right are, are confirmed as valid, then we can apply them uh, to the establishment and the assessment of institutions, of norms, of mores, of rules. We could ask, do our existing institutions, are, are they consistent with our principles? If not, in what way should they be reformed if found wanting? Should they be abolished if they're really wanting? And, and if so, what would replace them? So that's a, a more a applied level of, uh, of deliberation. Uh, Dr. Schneider, I got a question. Sure. Yes, please. I guess I'm trying to in my mind, I'm trying to put this in context and you use this in maybe like a real life scenario. Um, so in thinking about um, the University of Toledo um, as a whole, um, and I don't know our mission word for word, um, but I believe it's wrapped around, um, uh, you know, improving the human condition, right? Uh, improving the human condition. Yes. Um, and I really believe that focuses on uh, the work that we do, which is, uh, you know, preparing students for um, lives outside of college and careers. Um, I guess what I'm trying to do is, as I'm, I'm reflecting um, on our convictions, and, and correct me if I'm saying this wrong, but I'm reflecting on like what we say we stand for and what we're actually doing. Um, I don't know if those two actually line up well. Mm. They may, they may not. Would you say in the idea of improving or the commitment to improving the human condition is a moral conviction uh, or is it a principle? Uh, I would say a moral conviction. Okay, yes. So uh, with that, I, I would too, I would agree. Uh, so if we have that conviction that we're committed to improving the human condition, then uh, what, uh, what principles uh, what norms would we advocate that are consistent with that conviction? And once we've established a set of, of, of principles, then we could ask, do, are, we, uh, are our actions, the design of our institutions, our, the design of our policies, the design of uh, and the implementation of those policies are those consistent with our convictions and with our our moral principles. And if not, what do we have to uh, what do we have to do to change them? So that's the that's the basic idea here. 
we start with convictions, we move to principles, and then we move to an analysis or design of, uh, of institutions, of, of institutional norms, of rules, of policies. Uh, so a, a, moral, a moral analysis of our institutions would, would ask whether they are just, that is whether they comport with our affirmed principles of justice that are grounded and consistent and coherent with our very basic, very basic moral convictions. Does that make sense? It makes perfect sense, thank you. So this is uh, this process, which I just described, uh, was referred to by John Rawls as reflective equilibrium. It's the process of reflective equilibrium, and this is one of Rawls's great contributions. Uh, and it's a general process of moral deliberation and reflection, and and it's a process of of, de of deliberating on the consistency that is the coherence between our considered convictions and judgments and our moral principles, in particular our principles of justice and in turn our institutions. Uh, so um, co coherence or consistency refers to whether or not uh, there are any contradictions uh, between our convictions, our principles and our institutional practices. So uh, for, for example, we might, uh, we, we hold the, we might hold the, the moral conviction that all persons are equal or should be considered to be equal, morally equal. That is, they have an inherent, all persons have an equal, equal inherent dignity and value. And then we, uh, based upon that basic moral conviction, we would ask what kind of principles uh, would be consistent, what kind of principles of justice would be consistent with, the, with, the, with that conviction? And in turn, what kind of institutions uh, and institutional practices are consistent with our conviction of equality? And um, maybe some of our principles are not, are in contradiction. And many, maybe many of our institutional practices may contradict uh, our conviction of equality. They certainly they often do. Well, we're we're living through a period where, in stark relief, there's a profound contra uh, contradiction between our conviction of equality and our criminal justice system and the actions of our uh, of police forces in the country a, f a few actors uh, in the, but but generally perhaps even a, a institutional culture that is inconsistent with equality uh, so this gives us a way to um, to reason and deliberate about the justice the moral rightness of our principles and also our, uh, our institutions. So reflective equilibrium is a process of, of comparative deliberation and, and assessment um, that proceeds from thinking about reflecting on our relationship between our convictions and our principles. The pr our principles are justifiable and, and we, have, uh, we are motivated to affirm them when they are consistent with our expressed, uh, considered ethical and moral convictions. So moral so, deliberation is a kind of, of calculus, a kind of reflective calculus, a method of working out the justifiability of our values, our principles, and our social norms which we can refer to as reflective equilibrium. So we can turn to uh, some examples of our, 
of moral conviction convictions considered moral convictions um, which are commonly accepted ethical values and norms uh, one one in a democratic society we often uh, have hold a conviction or should hold a conviction of equality uh, the recognition of uh, of equal human dignity and intrinsic value of at least all persons and we'll we'll think about whether that can be extended to other living things as well. Uh, this notion of equality and human dignity, this conviction of equality, and, and uh, I should add, uh, some people may not hold that conviction in, in our society and other societies. They may hold a, uh, um, that some people are superior to others. Uh, but in, uh, and that that uh, that conviction, as we'll see, may would fail scrutiny. Would be fail. Would fail to be justifiable. Um, so if if we have if we hold a conviction of of uh, equality, then that leads to respect for persons. So if we're equal, then we owe each other respect, and that's another conviction. Respect for for persons is a significant. Uh, possible conviction that we hold, as well as freedom, liberty, autonomy, is uh, often held as a higher order ethical value, a higher order good to be free, to be, have liberty. Uh, a fourth is to do no harm to others, uh, that the conviction of no harm, uh, a prima facie basic moral duty to do no harm. Um, to others, all things being equal, we shouldn't. This is a conviction that we shouldn't harm others uh, intentionally. Uh, a fifth possible conviction is that uh, to recognize the fallibility of human reason and judgment, what Rawls called the burdens of judgment, that human reason is fallible, that we're not perfect in our thinking that we can disagree based upon the fallibility of human reason and that no, no one person or one group of persons can claim to have a monopoly on the truth. So a recognition of our fallibility. Um, another conviction, possible conviction is that we, um, that contingent morally ar arbitrary facts about persons that is our, our gender, our race, our, our religious choice, our sexual orientation, uh, whether we're bald or have hair, uh, et cetera, morally arbitrary facts about ourselves should not determine one's position and role in society, socially, economically, legally, and politically, uh, nor the rewards and benefits uh, of the society. So that's, uh, that's also a, a possible moral conviction that uh, our, our position and, bet, and role in society and the rewards and benefits of being in this society uh, should, should not be determined by morally arbitrary facts. And often they happen. Question. Determined. Question. Yes. In your in your thoughts, uh, why do you think? Because I have my own thoughts on this, but why do you think this is so? So why do you think we um, use these um, arbitrary facts to to I guess to kind of uh, separate people? What are your thoughts on it? Well, I think I think they're they're used, uh, and and they're often almost unconscious, but when they are become explicit in parts of the functioning. Of, of principles and institutions. They become ways of uh, justifying unequal treatment. They become ways of justifying institutions that function for the benefit of some people and the disadvantage of other people. Um, so there, they are often social constructs that are designed to perpetuate inequality and injustice. 
do, and, do you, and sorry. because uh, from a moral from the moral point of view, from a, the point of view of fairness, uh, whether I have blue eyes or brown eyes should make no difference at all in uh, my place in society, or whether I have a certain shade shade color or skin color that shouldn't or if I have certain features or if I'm a man or a woman right that shouldn't right. make any difference it shouldn't be determinant is the conviction and this relates to equality and respect for persons mm -hmm. uh, to treat to make decisions about and to design institutions around uh, contingent moral moral facts about persons that determine their place is uh, a very significant act of injustice mm -hmm. uh, in my view. And it explains uh, in part what, uh, what injustice may be about. So these, uh, the, the, the opposite conviction that you know, white men should rule the world uh, is uh, may, may not stand up, shouldn't stand up to further scrutiny if we, if we hold this conviction and have principles based on that conviction, as, as we'll see. Does that make sense? That makes sense. There are, uh, there, we also hold perhaps a, uh, a conviction about reasonable restrictions on the pursuit of self-interest um, that, uh, Certainly, uh, the pursuit of self-interest is rational and a part of being a free person. Uh, having liberty is about pursuing our self-interest, uh, pursuing a life plan uh, in our interests and, and perhaps in the interests of others that are close to us. And that's all fine and good. But if we pursue our self-interest at the expense, the significant expense of others, uh, in an unreasonable fashion, in an unjust fashion, if we exploit them, for example, to, to achieve our goals, uh, then uh, we're in violation of this, this conviction that, uh, that, that our, the, the pursuit of the rational pursuit of self-interest is limited by concern, by reasonable concern of others for others is a conviction that we might hold. And then, uh, and we'll we'll talk about that more. Um, in in the in the case of uh, oops, in the case of env of the environment, the natural environment, uh, we have been pursue humans have been pursuing their self interest at the expense of the natural environment and at the expense of other non human beings, other living things. One could argue that we've exploited systematically exploited nature to uh, to it to its de detriment uh, and that uh, that would that could be unreasonable that we could argue that's unreasonable I and then, uh, please uh, and I wish there was I don't know if this has like a a button where you can actually wave raise your hand I think that might be on another another app but um, when we think about um, no, you, you, can, again. you can wave. It's oh, I in, can wave. Okay. It's in reactions. Um, it's a reaction. Okay, cool. I, th I thought that was clapping. I didn't know that was waving. Okay. Um, <laughs> well, I guess it's clapping. <laughs> um, but when we, when we think about the exploitation uh, that we do, do, do you think this is a, is a natural behavior or is, is this something that's learned? whether it's exploit, exploiting the resources on the planet or exploiting um, others on the earth? Like, is that a, a learned behavior or is it just kind of in our nature? I, I think in general it's learned. Uh, but we, we have, we seem to have, a, we have a self-interest. We have, uh, we, we pursue self, and it's part of our being rational is to pursue our self-interest. Uh, but when, but we also have the capacity, a, uh, a capacity for a sense of justice, uh, a, a, 
a sense of reasonableness that the pursuit of our self-interest should avoid harming others. And that's also, I think, a part of our, our capacity as human beings, that we, we have the capacity to take the moral point of view. We have the capacity to take into consideration the well-being of others uh, when we uh, make our decisions about our, the pursuit of our interests. So uh, in the past, I would, uh, in class, I would say if, you know, what, what I, I have, I might have a self-interest to, uh, to take your laptop because it's a nice laptop, laptop and I need your laptop. But uh, I would never do that, right? Because I have a sense of reasonableness, a sense of justice, that that would harm you. Um, and so even though I might, it might be in my self-interest, um, I should uh, I should refrain from that exploitation. You you can see this in social groups as a feature of various kinds of tribalism. Uh, think of the mafia, uh, uh, organized crime, uh, an organized crime outfit. Uh, there they would they often argue that we're doing this in the interests of ourselves and our families, right? But we're we're exploiting these other people because it's just business, right? Uh, um, we and we don't care about those other people. Uh, we only care about our family, mm -hmm. uh, or we only care about our nation, right. or we only care about our species, perhaps. Um, and that uh, right, that was I got it. One could argue that might be unreasonable from a moral point of view. Does that make sense? So uh, this is a conviction about restrictions on the pursuit of our, our self-interest that uh, we should rest restrict our pursuit in the interest of others. And then finally, uh, the rule of law is a uh, we hold that as a conviction, perhaps, that uh, in particular, that no one is above the law, that uh, the society should be ruled by law, not by, by men or by persons. Um, and that that conviction is being challenged in our own time, in our own society, uh, by certain political groups. Uh, that the president claiming that the president is above the law, for example. So uh, rule of law might be a conviction as well. So these are examples of considered convictions, moral convictions that uh, I think are commonly held uh, among at least a majority, perhaps, maybe I'm wrong, of democratic citizens and others around the world over time. We could debate that if you'd like. So based on these moral, uh, these, uh, these conviction, convictions may be, uh, and other convictions may be uh, mistaken or unjustifiable. And a part of moral reasoning is to assess these convictions, to assess whether they are morally valid or not whether they are justifiable. We could ask uh, of any society, are the moral convictions of one society valid? That is, are they justifiable? Can they survive uh, critical scrutiny? Can, uh, can the conviction that, uh, can the, convi the moral conviction of a white supremacist survive scrutiny? moral scrutiny. Basically the conviction that uh, European, in particular often males, are superior to all other persons, that there isn't moral equality. Can that survive uh, scrutiny? I don't think it can, but, but that's the idea. So we, we sub should subject our convictions to a further level of, uh, of analysis, of scrutiny. 
So uh, we could ask on what grounds should our considered convictions be assessed? Uh, are there basic primary standards or of criteria that we can appeal to to evaluate our convictions? Um, and as Bayer suggested, we are thinking here of the conditions which something must satisfy in order to be properly called a morality. And the, these, this question refers to the test of the validity of our convictions and in turn our principles. And we could ask, what is the test? The test constitutes the moral point of view. Our moral convictions, convictions are true if they can be seen to be required or acceptable from the moral point of view. Uh, in other words, uh, the moral point of view tests the validity uh, or that uh, tests the validity proceed from a perspective and the, pers the specific normative presuppositions of that perspective define what it means to take a moral point of view. Uh, this idea originates with Immanuel Kant uh, who identified human dignity, although he might have applied it unevenly, unequally, but the presupposition that human dignity is foundational to morality and justice. And this is expressed in his categorical imperative, the second formulation, which is, uh, in my view, the key, his key contribution. Uh, to act in such a way that you always treat humanity, whether in your own person or in the person of any other, never simply as a means, but always at the same time as an end. This uh, treating of others and oneself, one's humanity and the humanity of others as an end is a fundamental presupposition of the moral point of view, a ba very basic moral conviction. Um, and this isn't merely an abstract idea. It has been grounded in the customs and principles of democratic societies and, in, and the international community, how uh, in, a, in an ideal sense, often not lived up to. Uh, but uh, there, nevertheless, as a, as a moral conviction. Um, and it's a, it's a part of the logic of, uh, of equality inherent in democracy, which uh, is cosmopolitan. It transcends cultural and political boundaries. So respect for human uh, dignity is a fundamental conviction, an ideal we try to strive for. We can expand, uh, we'll, much uh, of our future debate will be about expanding respect to uh, and giving uh, some, some notion of dignity to other living things as well. Now, uh, this respect for, for dignity uh, following John Rawls uh, rests upon the criteria of fairness. That is, uh, there are certain criteria that uh, follow from the moral conviction of equal dignity. And these, uh, these, are, these criteria are interconnected and they constitute the meaning of fairness. And there, there are three of them at least, uh, impartiality, generality, and reciprocity. And these are the fairness and these three criteria of fairness are the tests that we use, can use to determine the justifiability and validity of our moral convictions. So we can ask, do our convictions uh, comport or are they consistent with impartiality, generality, and reciprocity? Impartiality refers uh, uh, to uh, 
to the idea to be fair is to be unbiased. That uh, fairness demands that we impartially justify our claims as well as uh, impartially consider the claims of others. That is, we should strive for uh, strive not to be biased in our uh, moral deliberation. As we, we should strive to step back and not to pursue our, uh, limit our self-interest and to perhaps even give up our self-interest if it is morally wrong to pursue it. So the idea of impartiality. And this, is, uh, this applies to the law as well, that the, the judge, for example, in a trial uh, should remain impartial to the parties uh, involved in the trial. And would ha would we, we, we should recuse ourselves when we can't be impartial. That is, we, we can't sit in judgment of ourselves, or we can't sit in judgment of, of a family member or a friend or a friend, because we can't, we'll be tempted by too much bias if, uh, if we're too close to the person. So th that's an example of uh, impartiality. So to stri it's a striving towards uh, to be unbiased in our moral deliberations. Secondly, a generality uh, is, uh, suggests that moral justification is a demand for reasons that must be generally acceptable. Uh, reasons uh, must be capable of being shared by all or as many people as possible. So the terms of our justification, the reasons that, uh, that we appeal to in support of our moral claims should be generally acceptable. Uh, and knowable by others. And uh, thirdly, fairness re, uh, entails reciprocity, and reciprocity is uh, maybe the most important of these three elements. Uh, a reciprocity of mutual agreement uh, that uh, our claim must be acceptable to all affected. Um, first of all, uh, it, we cannot raise uh, any specific claims while rejecting like claims of others. Um, to claim uh, the validity of a, of a moral norm for oneself, but uh, to deny it for others is to violate re reciprocity. That is, uh, to be biased in favor of one's own interests. So it interlinks here with the impartiality. Also the uh, reciprocity of reasons, one can't simply assume that others share one's perspective. Reciprocity of, agree of agreement uh, requires that, quote uh, from Rawls, we arrange our common political life on terms that others cannot reasonably reject or as Thomas Scanlon suggested, think, quote, thinking about right and wrong is at the most basic level, thinking about what could be justified to others on grounds that they, if appropriately motivated, could not reasonably reject. And Rawls argued, citizens, quote, should be ready to explain the basis of their actions to one another in terms each could reasonably expect that others might endorse as consistent with their freedom and equality. And Rainer Forrest uh, suggests that, oops. Sorry about that. The defining feature of reasons that justify moral claims is that they must be reasons that cannot be reasonably, that is reciprocally and generally rejected. And this principle establishes the rational basis of justification 
the categorically binding norms against whose validity no good reasons could speak. So that's the idea of, uh, of reciprocity. Basically that we should, uh, the test is that whether uh, another person has grounds to reasonably reject our claim. If they do, then, uh, then our claim fails or our conviction fails to survive scrutiny. So this defines the uh, idea of justice as fairness. Um, that, and that moral justification is constructed through a fair procedure of deliberation. That the validity of the justification of moral claims, including justice, rests upon mutual agreement under fair conditions. So what is right, what is just, as inter what is a justifiable principle is that which we can uh, uh, agree to that all parties affected can agree to under fair conditions, under the conditions of impartiality, generality, and reciprocity. And valid moral norms and common ethical values rest upon shareable reasons exchanged in this fair deliberative process. So in this process, the legitimacy of the agreement is derived from the moral, the, moral validity of the criteria of fairness. That the legitimacy of the principles that we construct through this deliberate, deliberative process rests on the validity of the uh, three criteria of fairness. And this constitutes the moral point of view. Uh, these criteria of fairness uh, are constitute the moral the the moral point of view, and they're grounded in the recognition and respect for persons. And there are criteria that we can test the validity of our convictions and our principles, as well as our institutions. Um, we could we could look at specific examples of these convictions uh, as equality and respect for persons are foundational to the moral point of view. So from within that perspective, they they are valid by definition. Uh, liberty, the claim of a right to liberty as a value, um, also we could argue passes the test of fairness. Uh, liberty, equal liberty for all is of uh, general, impartial, and reciprocal value. Uh, no reasonable person would have reason to reject a right to liberty. They, a reasonable person would uh, have reason to reject any principle or practice that restricts liberty in an unfair way. Uh, the conviction of doing harm, do, doing no harm to others also uh, would be acceptable, one could argue, uh, on the grounds of fairness, as well as the, the recognition of the fallibility of human reason and judgment. To assert the infallibility of, a, of one's judgment is to privilege one's own reason over others and thus to be partial and non-reciprocal, which is a form of disrespect. To acknowledge the burdens of judgment is to be reasonable and respectful for, of others. Uh, contingently morally arbitrary facts as determinant in one's role in society and one's benefit also uh, would be generally accepted to acceptable to reasonable persons and pass the criteria of fairness as well, uh, as well as re reasonable restrictions on the pursuit of self-interest, that it is reasonable to limit 
uh, one's pursuit of self-interest based upon the moral consideration of others. And the rule of law uh, is a basic moral conviction that uh, no one is above the law. And that conviction follows from equality and respect for persons. We can't have an equal uh, society based upon equality if someone or some group is above the law. Uh, the law must apply equally uh, to all and equally protect um, all citizens. So the, the above analysis suggests that many of our convictions are valid in the sense they pass the test of fairness. Uh, and once we've established our some moral convictions, we can enter into reflection on the coherence between our convictions and our principles of justice and define the, what those principles might be. And a part of our task is to uh, explore various uh, principles of justice in the course. Um, a, a one example would be equal opportunity. Um, the, the principle of uh, the basic principle of justice of equal opportunity, which is consistent with the conviction that arbitrary facts shouldn't determine people's positions in society. That uh, arbitrary restricted characteristics such as race, class, and gender, and position, uh, rewards and benefits should be, uh, there should be no causal relation between them. And this can be expressed in terms of various principles of equality of opportunity, formal equality of opportunity, which is the absence of barriers to equal, uh, equal access to institutions, and fair equality of opportunity, which is the principle of, of the distribution of institutional resources that are, uh, are fair in terms of both the means that those institutions provide and the probability of success within those institutions. That uh, uh, people of like talent and like uh, ambition would have the same probability of achieving success in that institution, independently of, of morally arbitrary ascriptive characteristics. Finally, um, moral reflection and deliberation, moral reasoning also involve a critical assessment of invalid culturally violent justifications. Uh, that is the assessment of the validity of justifications that fail to survive when brought under the light of critical moral scrutiny. Because there are many, uh, many such uh, invalid justifications in any particular society, including our own, that are, are serve the interests of some uh, over others. And those, uh, a part of moral deliberation is to critique those invalid ideological justifications as a part of the moral process, the reasoning process. So there's a, also a critical thinking dimension uh, to moral reasoning as well. The assessment, uh, the assessment of the justifiability of, of principles and institutions includes the critical assessment of those norms and institutions. So in summary, the pro this process of reflective equilibrium is, is grounded in the moral point of view. And it's a deliberation about the justifiability of our moral convictions and the coherence between those convictions and our moral principles uh, from the perspective of respect for persons and the criteria of fairness the principles that best cohere with our basic moral convictions, whose validity is confirmed within the moral point of view, are ones that have the best justifying reasons. What follows, we will uh, explore 
our convictions, our principles, and our practices uh, from this point of view. Thanks.